Welcome to the Gold Level, creating a commitment to trauma-informed practice. At the final level, the focus shifts again from the skills and approaches required to integrate a trauma-informed approach to practice, to consider how we create and sustain a commitment to this way of working. Comprised of three chapters, Chapter 6 opens by focusing on understanding organisations, trauma, power and betrayal. Chapter 7, entitled Our Hearts, examines the impact of working with trauma on our own lives. And finally, Chapter 8, Making Sense of Trauma-Informed Practice, is dedicated to providing a structure for trauma-informed interventions, weaving together knowledge and practice to create this commitment. Chapter 6, Organisational Responses to Trauma, Power and Betrayal. While so far the training has focused on our individual practice, it's important to note that the organisations and systems in which we work, and work with, have a profound influence on our capacity to adopt and sustain this approach. Understanding the extent of this impact and the ways in which it may shape our practice and the experiences of those we seek to support is critical at this level. With knowledge, we can create change, challenge practice and illuminate inequalities and identify areas for improvements. We can advocate and give voice to those who have been oppressed and marginalised. We can highlight the disparities between organisational priority and the needs of those it claims to serve. Most significantly, though, it urges us to look beyond those explicit injustices, to notice the more subtle ways in which the misuse of power sustains vulnerability and dependency. So often, in such circumstances, kindness, compassion and empathy are not just absent, but unkindness, insensitivity and disregard are present instead. In 2012, I established a bereavement support service for military families following the death of their loved one while serving with the British military in Afghanistan. During this time, I witnessed firsthand how the military's response to a death had the potential to provide the bereaved family with much needed comfort and support. I also observed how organisational processes and practices served to exacerbate the anguish and pain of bereaved families at the worst moment in their lives. Curious to know more, I embarked on a doctoral research project which involved interviewing 20 bereaved military families who had lost a loved one while serving on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan between 2006 and 2017. The study focused specifically on their experiences of and relationship with the military. And whilst it was evident that some of the research participants considered the organisation's response to be beneficial and a source of solace, many did not. Instead, they provided a litany of examples where choice was denied and ownership of their loved one stolen from them. They described how their relationship with the military was contingent on their compliance and their good behaviour. They explained how non-conformity was punished by the sudden withdrawal of support and contact, creating hurt and confusion, leaving them to endure further loss. In short, they illustrated the ways in which the military's priorities took precedence over their own, regardless of the cost. Whilst the military is a unique institution with a distinct culture, for the bereaved families in this study, it was also an organisation upon which they had to depend for the return of the body of their loved one and their possessions, for information about the circumstances of their death, for financial support, for how they would be buried, honoured and remembered, and for how long. The specific circumstances which these families faced were without a doubt exceptional. What is not unusual is the extent to which we're dependent on organisations, systems and services for health and social care, financial support, housing, asylum, refuge, protection and legal support. The list is endless. Quite simply, organisations, systems and services have power and how they exert this power has profound implications for our lives and those we work with. When we make a commitment to trauma-informed practice, it is a commitment to offer kindness, care, compassion and connection. Equally, we must make a commitment to question and challenge the practices of those services and systems upon which those who we work with are dependent. In doing so, we must pay attention to power and the ways in which it's possessed and enacted, and we must be prepared to contest and advocate when harm is caused. This is not easy work, but it is necessary work. The pledge to bear witness does not just extend to those individuals we seek to support, but asks that we not turn away from oppression, suppression, marginalisation, inequality, unfairness, ineffectiveness and unkindness. This witnessing work demands that we notice, show up, be curious, ask difficult questions, engage in advocacy, campaigning and in some cases, activism. 
Organisations and systems have the potential to be both the source of and to exacerbate someone's experiences of trauma and struggle. However, they also have the capacity to create the very foundation from which healing and hope can emerge. A commitment to trauma-informed practice means that we must learn to recognise the possibility for both. This first chapter draws on many of my own experiences, both in my clinical practice, my research and in service development. I must start this chapter with a disclaimer though. I do not have the answers. Perhaps sometimes there can be no answers, but I can share my reflections, explain the challenges that I have faced and my response to these, and perhaps most importantly, what I have gone on to learn. I will be honest in sharing my regrets, my triumphs, and those things that I should and I wish I could have done differently had I been less tired, depleted, and less intimidated, less afraid. Whilst much of my work over the past two decades has been characterised by efforts to understand and challenge organisational practices which cause harm, I have come to know that the simple act of recognising, naming and highlighting such practices are, in and of themselves, immensely powerful, at times acting as a catalyst for change. This can be particularly effective for those who are adversely impacted by organisational practices, enabling them to cast off guilt, shame and self-blame, leaving room for support and care in their place. Sometimes, frustratingly, this is all we can do, but is no means irrelevant. It offers validation, hope and solidarity and creates those opportunities for reconnection. Although I do not have the answers, I would encourage you to think about how my reflections may resonate with your own experiences in practice and to take the time to consider how those systems and organisations you work with and within may be responsible for exacerbating distress or creating healing and hope, or both. Encouragingly, research and practice have also demonstrated that change is possible and that even seemingly marginal alterations can have a profound impact. Trauma-informed practice does not mean undermining organisational priorities or their rules. Rather, it encourages choice and the sharing of power so that priorities of the organisation and those it claims to serve can be aligned, generating benefit for both parties. The next few slides will share instances where organisational practices have caused harm increased anxiety and exacerbated distress. These offer useful examples of how power over rather than power sharing is used to exert authority and control and to deny or restrict choice, leaving the recipient to feel powerless. The next slide shares a letter which was received by a mother in relation to an appointment for her child to see a specialist about her eyesight. The mother had been on a waiting list for services for nearly 12 months and had been offered an assessment appointment in six months' time. Four months before the appointment, she received this letter. I'll read it out loud for those who are listening to the training rather than following the video. Dear parent or guardian, this is to inform you that your child's appointment with the ophthalmology orthoptist team on Wednesday 15th of March 2023 at 9.20am has been cancelled. This is due to the reason indicated below. Following a clinical review, the decision has been made to change your child's appointment so that they will see a more appropriate clinician. We will contact you to arrange a new appointment. Yours sincerely. Imagine waiting so long for an appointment and then receiving this letter. Imagine telling your child that they have to wait even longer and you don't know how long now. Imagine the frustration, the disappointment and the anger. Imagine the fear that it might get worse and that there is nowhere else to go. Now imagine if they'd offered a time frame for a new appointment, a phone number to call for more information. Imagine if they'd expressed remorse and apologised. Imagine if they'd shown kindness and compassion in this letter. The second example is the text which was typed onto a sticky label and fixed to a letter inviting a mother to attend their 12 week scan at the hospital's antenatal unit. It was received in June 2020 during the first lockdown. As things stand, we ask that you attend this appointment alone. Partners and other companions must wait outside the hospital. When lockdown rules are eased, this policy may change. Check the hospital website or phone us to query the latest rules. Imagine finding out that you were expecting a baby during the middle of a global pandemic, when both the present and the future seem so fraught with uncertainty and fear. Imagine having to go to a scan alone, without the support of your partner, friend or family member. As the recipient of this letter, I did not need to imagine any of these things. I felt them all. 
but I did imagine how this message would feel for someone who'd struggled to conceive or had experienced a miscarriage or a difficult pregnancy in the past. I imagine how it would impact on their access to support, rendering them vulnerable, isolated and disempowered at a time when they most needed connection and compassion. In doing so, I also imagined a different message, one which took up exactly the same amount of space, gave exactly the same directive, but acknowledged its effect with an apology instead. One which offered understanding, humanity and a semblance of hope that was so precious to all of us during this time that things might change and be returned to normal. We are incredibly sorry but patients are unable to bring partners or other companions to this appointment. We hope that when the lockdown rules are eased this policy will change. For further information please check the hospital website or phone us. I used the same number of words precisely to demonstrate that a commitment to kindness, care, compassion and empathy need not take up more space. We can work within those structures and rules that are already available. All it takes is for us to imagine. Finally, I gave myself the permission to write another version of this message. One which still doesn't change the rules, but it does take up more space and require more time. However, also expresses more understanding, offers more connection and provides more support. In doing so, the intention is to create less anxiety, fear and frustration and to reduce the possibility of harm. We are incredibly sorry, but due to the current pandemic, patients are unable to bring partners or other companions to this appointment. We hope that when the lockdown rules are eased, this policy will change. We understand that this restriction may cause disappointment or additional anxiety for some patients. And although we ask that you attend this appointment alone, if your partner or companion has specific questions they wish to ask, we would encourage you to write these down and bring them to discuss with the midwife, who will allow extra time to go through these and provide information for you to pass on to them. Please note that due to the current circumstances, we are waiving our fee for scanned photographs so that you can share these with your family after the appointments. If you have any concerns regarding the appointment, or feel that you may require additional support, please feel free to contact us beforehand to discuss further. We look forward to seeing you at the clinic. The final example in this section is from a charity working with vulnerable women and their families to provide a range of services, including tenancy support. By the time the organisation approached me to request training in creating a trauma-informed service, they were already in the process of reviewing their practices and the ways in which they delivered care. One of the main challenges that they faced was the tension between offering support to their clients and the legal responsibility to ensure their tenancies were managed in line with their policies to ensure a safe environment. In practice, this meant having difficult and uncomfortable conversations when their clients did not or could not adhere to their rules. Such transgressions initiated a process of warnings being delivered via a letter outlining why they were being received and the consequences of continuing to act in a way which was not aligned with the conditions outlined in their tenancy agreements. It's important for me to highlight a number of things here. Firstly, I noticed that when organisations approach me with a request to become trauma-informed, more often than not, they're already well on their way to achieving this through their desire to improve care, their capacity to reflect and their willingness to question their practice, both individually and organisationally. My role is simply to aid this process through the delivery of knowledge to enable understanding and to provide reassurance to support these changes. Efforts to alter the content and effect of these warning letters had already begun. However, I wanted to share their original letter to give you the opportunity to reflect on its approach, the language which it uses and the message that it intends to convey. Dear Tenant, I'm concerned that you have allowed arrears to build up despite the efforts made by support staff to collect your rent from you. You are clearly in breach of the tenancy agreement that you signed, which requires you to pay the charges for your accommodation weekly in advance. Keeping this agreement is not optional and you must pay your rent weekly in advance. I therefore insist that you either clear these arrears immediately or discuss with support staff how much you can afford to pay on a weekly or monthly basis by using the arrears repayment plan setting out a suitable yet affordable amount to reduce your arrears. This arrears repayment plan must be signed by both yourself and your support worker, a copy of which will be kept in your tenant file and a copy sent to the finance department at head office. 
It is essential that you take this opportunity to deal with these arrears, as if you continue to build up your arrears, we will take you to court, which will increase the amount you owe us and it will affect your credit rating for the future. Your support staff can explain why this is to be avoided at all costs. Any difficulties you may have paying the arrears need to be discussed with support staff immediately. Yours sincerely. The intention is clear. The client must make immediate arrangements to clear their rent arrears. To not do so has dire and long-term consequences affecting their future. No matter what else is happening for them or to them, action on this issue should take precedence. Choice and control has been removed and the only way back is repayment. If they are in a place of struggle, support workers can be notified, but the extent to which they may offer support and in what form is obscured by the organisation's priority to address the rent arrears, with its bold emphasis on not optional, it is evident that there's little room for anything else. This letter is problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, its tone is punitive. It both blames and shames the client for their non-compliance. It is unwilling to consider how they may have come to this place. Secondly, it removes choice and control by outlining only one route to address this situation, repayment or face legal action. Thirdly, kindness, compassion, understanding and support are absent. Someone has peered into the shadows, dropped this letter and turned away, leaving them alone again in both their darkness and their financial struggle. When I shared these observations with the organisation, two responses emerged. The first, confusion and uncertainty. How else can we enforce the rules? They are the law and as such there is limited space for adaptation and manoeuvre. The second response asked, if not for this punitive approach, how else can behaviour change? How else can they come to understand that their actions have consequences? Challenging such assumptions underpins this commitment to trauma-informed practice. In asking what's right with someone, instead we imagine that someone is doing the best they can with the resources that they have available to them. Rather than wishing that they could behave differently, we instead focus on what is rather than what is not. In doing so, we construct a way back which is easy to locate, navigate and accompanied by support, delivered by those who will join you on this journey, who will seek to understand, offer choices, work in collaboration and be committed to finding this way back with you. Many of you will work within and with organisations and systems where receipt of services is contingent on a whole host of factors, such as engagement, commitment, behaviour, and sometimes even capacity and willingness to change. You will already be familiar with the challenge of balancing these conditions with the desire to offer support and care which is free from judgment and unconditional. I'd like you to take 10 minutes now to reflect on this version of the letter and start to think about language, tone, and the meaning that it intends to convey, and the rules that it's trying to enforce. Make some notes, suggest some changes, or if you have the time, create an alternative version. Think about power and how it shows up, the principles of trauma-informed practice, the qualities needed to reach beyond connection, to offer reconnection instead. Think about joining someone in their darkness and what might be needed to create those flickers of light. Write that letter. In the third version of our letter, we shifted from referring to it as a warning letter to a letter of concern. This is perhaps best reflected in the final paragraph of the letter, which tries to simultaneously consider the legal duty of the organisation and their responsibilities around tenancy agreements under the law, as well as their dedication to support their clients to achieve their goals. It is important that we make you aware that if you are not able to meet the conditions of your tenancy under law, this may be viewed as you making yourself intentionally homeless, which means that the local authority could withdraw your right to provide you with alternative accommodation. We want to do everything possible to avoid things reaching this stage and would welcome any feedback from you about what support you may need to assist you in maintaining your tenancy. This version is far from perfect and I have no doubt that continued time and effort will improve and refine it even further. However, it's equally important that it does not become too overwhelming or too time consuming, as this in itself will act as a barrier to creating a commitment to trauma-informed practice. Most significantly though, we should never underestimate the value and impact of simply being human. 
So often in the accounts of my research participants, the humanity of those who supported them was highlighted and remembered for the ways in which it offered kindness and compassion at the worst moment in their lives. For example, a bereaved mother recalled how the officer who came to notify her and her husband of their son's death was desperate to do his best for them, remaining present throughout the night until the wider family arrived, continually writing down their questions so that he could try and find the answers for them. Other families shared similar stories of care and kindness which went above and beyond what was expected. In my research, I described this as the personalising of the organisation's bereavement process, which saw those responsible for providing information and support step outside of their role as a representative of the military to ensure that the needs, wishes and priorities of the bereaved family took precedence over organisational processes. They could not and did not change systems, but they could and did transform how these were experienced by those that they cared for. Any triumph was often so small that it was barely detectable, but to these families, in the darkest of all places, it was absolutely everything. However, sometimes noticing, witnessing and paying attention is not enough, and action and activism are required instead. Challenging power renders us both isolated and vulnerable to its effects, and finding allies and networks of support is essential. We must seek out those other practitioners, professionals, victims, survivors and organisations who are willing to join us in our protest. In 2012, some six months after I had started working with bereaved military families, I received a call unexpectedly from a senior military representative at Army Headquarters in Hampshire. The call was relatively brief. It started with a request to know who'd authorise my work with bereaved military families and ended with an admonishment that I should stop. He was indignant and defensive, explaining how the military already provided the support and care that I was offering, that there was no need for my involvement. In fact, I was creating disruption and diversion, compromising care and support. For days afterwards, I was contrite and confused, questioning the value and worth of the service that I'd developed. I'm not sure to this day what motivated me to keep going, beyond my knowing that these bereaved families needed the care and support that I was providing. Their feedback and the feedback of the military commanders and welfare teams I worked alongside was vital in strengthening my resolve. But it was also probably the first time in my career that I'd observed firsthand the devastating impact of organisational power and felt compelled and able to intervene. Over the past decade, I've gone on to find allies in this work, campaign groups such as Liberty's Military Justice Programme and later the Centre for Military Justice legal professionals, academics and practitioners, both in the UK and overseas. In addition to continuing my clinical work, writing and research provide not just a place of refuge, but from this position, I can regain power through giving voice to these experiences, my own and those who I seek to support. As funding for my clinical work came to an end in 2014, I wrote an article questioning the military's bereavement process, highlighting how the impact of it was unknown the editor suggested that I consider engaging in doctoral level research so that I might examine these questions for myself. So in 2016, I started a PhD and again found that reading and listening to the stories of my research participants gave me the confidence to question, to critique, to challenge and to demand change. I must caution that there is no happy nor successful outcome to this story. There was no watershed moment in which my voice was heard and change was created. Instead, there were continued attempts to confuse and disorientate. For example, when I started my fieldwork for my PhD, my supervisors received an email from a civil servant within the Ministry of Defence expressing their concern that I did not fully understand their systems and perhaps most significantly insisting that I required their permission to speak to the families. This was refuted by the university and the organisation fell quiet for a while. Yet despite these allies, I was very aware of its looming presence all around me it is designed to intimidate and undermine, and of course it does. I'm fearful of this power, of its potential reach and of the ways that it might derail my work and, most importantly, shatter my confidence. Yet it's the stories of my research participants that continue to drive my dedication to highlight injustice and to generate the changes that are so desperately needed. As well as seeking allies, a commitment to trauma-informed practice demands the courage to be one of these allies for those that we care for and those that we work alongside. After all, it's these networks of support which will catch us when we stumble and fall, and even when we're not in that position to contest or challenge ourselves, 
we must support those who are and who do. I wish to share an example of this from my research. In her interview, bereaved mother Sarah explained how immediately after her son James was killed in Afghanistan in 2009, she expressed a desire to visit the country where he'd died. She describes how in the years that followed, her requests to do this were denied, yet she continued to ask. In the aftermath of James's death, Sarah had met with a number of senior Ministry of Defence officials, including the then Chief of Defence Staff. In one of his letters after the meeting, the Chief of Defence Staff wrote how it was his wish that she would one day be able to travel there. Whether it was this compelling statement from a well-positioned ally, or Sarah's determination and perseverance, or a combination of both, in October 2012 she was granted her request to travel to Afghanistan. The impact of being able to do this is perhaps best captured in Sarah's account as she explains how it was just like a weight had been lifted off me. I was so determined to get there for him. I just kept thinking, I didn't get there when you needed me, but I did what I set out to do and I got there for you. Some people can't understand why I wanted to go there and I can't always put into words, but I just felt like it was somewhere where I should have been when he needed me. I was going to get there anyway, somehow. Other research participants who'd expressed a desire to travel to Iraq and Afghanistan to visit the place where their loved one had died were not afforded the right to do so. However, Sarah's case may be used in future to question this precedence of denial. Her challenge and achievement has disrupted the process, raised questions, created confusion and highlighted what this opportunity may mean to bereaved families in their darkest moments. In moments of despair and frustration, I think back to this interview as I sat with Sarah for nearly four hours in her living room, listening to her story and reading those letters. Inside her anguish and grief, her wish to visit the country where her son had taken his last breath, to stand on the ground where he'd last walked, and to meet the communities he had so believed that he would help, gave her the strength and comfort needed to continue to live within her anguish and grief. Such moments may take years of endurance to cultivate, but I expect that Sarah, like so many others whose struggle and pain is used as fuel for action and activism, such moments are worth the wait. When we join someone in their darkness and make a commitment to bear witness to distress, we are privileged to observe acts of protest, defiance and resistance. We must remember that in making a commitment to trauma-informed practice, we must go beyond our ability to offer connection, to extend compassion through action, collaboration and affiliation. We must be both a witness and an ally. Only then might change, individually and collectively, become imaginable. So often when I share the findings of my research, questions are asked about intentionality. Are organisations intentionally misusing their power, causing harm to those it claims to serve and benefit? Is the language of those appointment letters deliberate in denying choice, stripping away control, evoking anxiety and rendering us frustrated and powerless? Or are they indicative of a lack of knowledge, understanding and an under-resourced and overstretched National Health Service that simply can't think beyond their own place of darkness? Is the response of the military after the death of a service person designed to oppress, marginalise and exert control over the bereaved family, exacerbating their distress? Or are their priorities, rituals, traditions and rules a safe haven from the messiness of human emotion and the anguish of loss? A place where they do not have to bear witness nor question the precarious of their own lives? Does the charity managing the tenancies of vulnerable women really believe that punitive action is the only way, or do they simply not know any other way? For so many of the services and systems that we work with and within, the pandemic has had a profound and devastating impact, leaving an endemic of unkindness in its wake. Organisations are under-resourced, impoverished and facing an increased demand for services. They are stripped to the bone, depleted, exhausted, frustrated and afraid. They too have been plunged into darkness. In much the same way that people can experience trauma, stress, struggle and adversity, so too can organisations. Indeed, even without the effect of a global pandemic, these systems are exposed to trauma in varying forms on a daily basis, rendering them vulnerable to its effects. As Rachel Naomi Remen writes in her book, Kitchen Table Wisdom, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water and expecting not to get wet. Dr Karen Traceman, a clinical psychologist specialising in working with organisations and trauma, 
explains how, just like people, organisations are alive. They're always developing and adapting and can be equally vulnerable to stress. Loss, dissociation and toxic stress can spread like contagion throughout an organisation. When this happens, it can become traumatised, unhealthy and distressed, which can result in practices that induce rather than reduce trauma, resulting in a trauma-driven culture. Such characteristics include a tendency towards reactivity in crisis. Traumatised systems are often high alert, hypervigilant and on edge. They are busy, too busy to think and feel, too busy to reflect and learn. They are chaotic and disconnected, disintegrated, incoherent and fragmented. They can be avoidant, numb, detached or dissociated, either emotionally or from the organisational mission, or both. As a result, they are confused, lost, alone and disorientated unable to regulate themselves and create a sense of stability. They are frozen, frustrated, rigid and inflexible, striving for a perfectionism which lies beyond anyone's reach, no matter how hard they work or the lengths that they may go to to stretch their limits. Such efforts create a sense of helplessness and depression, loss and grief, sickness rates are high, recruitment and retention difficult. So often systems become isolated and disconnected, not only from themselves, their own values and commitment, but from those who operate in the space around them. They are suspicious and polarised in their thinking. It is us and them, good or bad, with nothing in between. Collaboration, partnership and sharing of power are impossible to grasp. Instead, fear, indecision and powerlessness is often all that remain. Working with and within traumatised systems is challenging. Such environments can often be experienced as toxic, lacking in safety, trust and humanity. Disconnection is rife, alliances difficult to find and form. Despite the harm that they cause, such environments can be strangely compelling. There's this sense that if we can just contort ourselves a little more, compromise our values, ethics and beliefs, stretch our commitment, exert more effort, offer more time, sacrifice more of ourselves, we might just be able to fix and repair these systems. These thoughts are exhausting, exasperating and frustrating and can render us angry, depleted and fatigued. Then we disconnect, distance and detach from ourselves, our values and beliefs that once inspired this work, giving it meaning, our colleagues and those very organisational goals that we were working so tirelessly to accomplish. The next chapter will focus on the impact of working with trauma on our own hearts. However, as this chapter demonstrates, making a commitment to trauma-informed practice asks that we look beyond our own practice to question organisational practices and their effects. Perhaps most significantly, it also asks for our understanding and the recognition that systems and organisations are also susceptible to the effects of trauma, that they too may find themselves plunged into darkness, isolated and disconnected from the very values and beliefs which once inspired their work. Working with and within traumatised organisations may also break our hearts, and so the next chapter focuses not only on our hearts, but how they both affect and are affected by those we work with and alongside. Making a commitment to trauma-informed practice is not about fixing these systems. This would be an almost impossible task. However, it is about finding ways to work with and within these systems with clarity, understanding, kindness, compassion, empathy, skill and grace. It is about making a commitment to cultivate and rebuild trust, restore faith, share power, reclaim and reaffirm aspirations. In short, it's about reconnecting with the very foundations upon which these systems first came into being, their desire to serve, protect and provide care. What I know from my own clinical work and my research is that organisations have both the potential to exacerbate and ease pain, and so we must find a way to navigate within these systems which minimises harm and betrayal and offers solace and healing instead. Chapter 7. Our Hearts. The Impact of Working with Trauma. A commitment to trauma-informed practice demands our whole hearts, and so we must also know how to repair our hearts, so that both we and our practice can thrive and survive. This chapter is not about preventing our hearts from breaking. It's about how we mend them, recognising that it may not always be possible to protect them. When we join someone in their darkness, our world darkens too. When we bear witness to distress, pain and anguish permeate our hearts. We see parts of humanity that others do not, cannot and would not wish to see. This witnessing work can often take us beyond that which we know of humanity, to places of inhumanity, 
atrocity, brutality and torment. Once seen, we cannot unsee. Once known, we cannot turn away. As Judith Lewis Herman writes in her work on trauma and recovery, it is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action, engagement and remembering. In 2015, after over two years of working with bereaved military families during the latter part of the Afghanistan campaign, I knew that my heart was broken with the stories of these families. I felt overwhelmed, helpless, tired and depleted. In knowing this, I sought refuge in a world that I thought would not break my heart, and so I accepted a position managing a mental health team in a men's maximum security prison instead. Here I encountered an environment that was so tightly controlled and regulated, it became almost entirely possible to provide care without using my heart. I was that bystander who was asked only to do nothing. For a while this offered the respite that I was looking for. But after a few months I found that I could not remain quiet and inactive any longer. For anyone who works with perpetrators, you come to know that this label is not the only one they wear. All too often they are also victims of abuse, exploitation and trauma. And it's these such experiences that demand our attention, asking to be noticed, and that we share that burden of pain. In addition, working with perpetrators did not diminish the power of my imagination. Instead, I imagined the pain of their victims and the grief of their families, the sense of helplessness reawakened, this time intensified by a sense of guilt that I was no longer prepared to bear witness to this. After nearly a year, I left the prison and returned to work with those victims and their bereaved families. However, this experience did provide me with the rest that I craved, but perhaps most significantly, it taught me something important about heartbreak that would sustain my practice forever. I learned that heartbreak was not something to be avoided, nor was it evidence of my inability to bear witness to distress. It was not a sign of weakness or an indicator that boundaries had become blurred. It was not a mark on my professionalism or proof of my incompetence. In fact, it was the opposite. The capacity to use my whole heart even when it might break my heart, was my greatest gift to offer. In her book, Untamed, Glennon Doyle writes, Heartbreak is not something to be avoided, it's something to pursue. Heartbreak is one of the greatest clues of our lives. She goes on to ask, What is it that affects you so deeply that whenever you encounter it, you feel the need to look away? Look there. Where is the pain in the world that you just cannot stand? Stand there. The thing that breaks your heart is the very thing you were born to help heal. Every world changer's work begins with a broken heart. However, enduring heartbreak is not the only risk we face when we bear witness to trauma, struggle, pain and distress. Burnout, compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma are various terms which have been used to describe these possible effects. Burnout is a term which remains distinct from compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma. It is not exclusively experienced by those working in the caring profession or practitioners working with trauma. Rather, any profession, role or type of work can cause burnout. Defined as a state of physical and emotional exhaustion, more specifically it's characterised by diminished motivation, pervasive helplessness, frustration, a sense of failure, loss of power and agency, a lack of value and appreciation, increased loneliness and detachment, withdrawal and isolation, overwhelm and procrastination. Like all forms of stress, burnout impacts both on our physical and mental health, meaning that we're more susceptible to illness. In contrast, compassion fatigue is defined by Charles Figley as a state of exhaustion and dysfunction biologically, psychologically and socially as a result of prolonged exposure to compassion stress and all it invokes. Compassion fatigue is a term used to describe the effect of caring for or supporting someone who is experiencing trauma, struggle, anguish or distress. Here we see how offering empathy, connection, kindness and care may incur a cost for the caregiver that goes beyond breaking their heart, rendering them so exhausted and depleted that they have nothing left for themselves, their families or their own lives. They are no longer able to join someone in the darkness. They have become trapped in a darkness of their very own. In compassion fatigue, it is not that we've become tired of caring or too tired to care. It is that caring has created such exhaustion we have become disconnected and isolated and this in turn compromises our capacity to offer care and those essential qualities to cultivate reconnection, creating a barrier to our commitment to trauma-informed practice. 
Distinct from compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma is a term coined by Lisa McCann and Laurie Perlman in 1990 to describe the personal transformation experienced by those who work with trauma. Here the focus is on the trauma itself rather than the impacts of caring for the person who's experienced it. In their work, McCann and Perlman argue that vicarious trauma occurs in response to cumulative and empathic engagement with another person's trauma, leading to long-term changes to how someone experiences themselves, others and the world. As another form of traumatic stress, those who experience vicarious trauma may be confronted with those same effects as outlined in Chapter 1. Put quite simply, when we make a commitment to sit beside someone in their darkness, it casts a shadow over our own lives, and perhaps most significantly it calls into question everything we thought we knew about the world, shattering our assumptions too. Like those we sit beside, we are also struggling to make sense of those experiences, create meaning and find safety and certainty. One evening in 2015, shortly after I'd started working in the prison, I tried to contact Gareth, my then boyfriend, now my husband. We lived separately and during the working week had little contact, in part because of the rules around mobile phones in the prison. We had become accustomed to not communicating unless there was a practical need to do so. On this particular evening, I'm unable to recall why I sent him a message, only that he did not reply. I sent another and still received nothing in return. I tried to call and I left a voicemail. He was a serving army officer based a little over an hour away from where I lived. I sent a message to one of his university friends, also based in the same location, to ask if he'd seen him. He had not. Very quickly, in the space of less than two hours, I became convinced that he was dead. I paced up and down in the hallway, peering out of the window onto the dark street, waiting for the notification officer who would eventually arrive to tell me this news. I called my parents and my older sister, convincing them too that there could be no other explanation. When I could stand the anticipation no longer, I got into the car and I drove the hour north to his flat on the edge of Catrick Garrison. By now it was past nine at night and still there had been no word from him. On the drive there I could consider no other truth than his death. Upon arrival I noted his car outside and when no one answered the door I let myself in using a key which he'd given me. Inside was quiet. My dog, Phoebe, who was staying with him for the week, came over to greet me. Gareth was not there. A quick search located a printed email containing the details of a social event that evening in the officer's mess. Next to it, I found his phone and his car keys. Of course, I did what any self-respecting woman in her early 30s in a relatively new relationship would do. I left and pretended I'd never been there. But I could not deny that my world was unravelling. I saw death everywhere, expecting it in every telephone call and with every knock on the door. I worried about the safety of those I loved, creating more elaborate ways to assure myself that they were alive and well. Every text message received late at night indicated a disaster, every illness a sign of anguish yet to come. My imagination was running riot, carelessly and easily, constructing more and more scenarios for me to foresee. It was frightening and exhausting. I no longer felt safe in the world. I knew that loss, pain, suffering and anguish were both possible and likely and I did not know how I would ever be able to survive them. There was no single experience which had shattered my safety, no one case which I can identify as the point at which my assumptions of the world were irretrievably broken. It happened gradually over time with each bereaved family I cared for. Their pain became my pain and their reality my fear. Such anticipation showed up as anxiety, and I clamoured for control by planning, checking and imagining. Many of us do this. We know that the world is not safe, and so we do our best to create safety for ourselves and those we love. When we stand in those shadows, we see the parts of humanity that others do not. And whilst we remain there to bear witness so that someone is not alone, it can break our hearts, fracture our hopes and dreams and change our worlds. After two decades, I have not yet learnt how to eradicate these effects only how to live with and around them, to know that the darkness exists and that I can sit there while savouring and embracing those parts that let in the light. Recognising joy and happiness are as important as knowing the darkness. They will sustain us during those times when pain threatens to engulf us, creating light in the darkness and reminding us that there is something beyond where we have found ourselves. The antidote to such anxiety is not positivity, but neutrality. As with the care we give to those we support, we do not push gratitude or ask someone to think positively. Rather, we accept who and where they are with compassion, understanding, kindness and empathy. 
Whilst there are ongoing debates in the literature with regards to why some practitioners experience vicarious trauma and others do not, Joanna Fleck and Rachel Francis, in their work on vicarious trauma and the legal profession, argue that being able to describe the fact of our exposure to trauma should not be controversial. It is not a matter of who is and isn't affected. Rather, it is a fact of life. Whilst they write specifically about its impact on legal professionals, considering vicarious trauma as a fact of life for all practitioners who work with trauma, struggle, distress and adversity, allows us to remove judgment and reduce the propensity for shame and blame to occur. Much like heartbreak, for many of us who make a commitment to trauma-informed practice, vicarious trauma demonstrates our willingness to look and stand in those places where no one wishes to be. That said, both heartbreak and vicarious trauma can compromise our own well-being and, to borrow the term from Pema Chodron, alongside burnout and compassion fatigue, they are the far enemies of a trauma-informed approach, creating disconnection, disengagement, dissatisfaction, depletion and fatigue. Creating a commitment to a trauma-informed approach is not about avoiding heartbreak or vicarious trauma. Rather, it's about knowing their presence, understanding their effects and the permission to pay attention to your own needs to seek out and accept the offer of reconnection from others. When you join someone in their darkness, you may stumble and fall, and so it's essential that you have your own networks of support to create those flickers of light to guide you out again. After all, you cannot offer either connection or reconnection from a position of disconnection. This chapter is not intended to provide specific ideas and strategies for self-care. Much is already written on this topic. Instead, this chapter serves to highlight how the practice of trauma-informed care requires that we tend to ourselves with the same care, compassion, kindness and understanding that we extend to others. In doing so, it asks that we withhold self-criticism and view ourselves with acceptance instead. In short, it demands that everything we give to others in our gift of reconnection, we ask both of and for ourselves. Remember those wise adaptations in Chapter 2 and the power of reframing. When our hearts break, we find ways to cope and survive in the best way we know how. Recognising these personal transformations as wise adaptations allows us to survive. It helps us to find the space needed to rest, replenish and repair our broken hearts. In doing so, we open ourselves to new ways of seeing and being in the world, to a view which acknowledges the darkness but creates the freedom to enable us to also see the most incredible light, so that we might not just survive, but thrive as well. Remember those qualities of reconnection in chapter four, the significance of kindness, compassion, empathy, withholding judgment and extending acceptance, bearing witness and holding space, story stewardship, understanding, curiosity and humility, creativity, commitment and courage. These must be turned inwards as well as given out. They must be asked of those in our lives and willingly received with gratitude and grace. Remember the magic creativity in chapter five, for the many ways in which we can soothe, express and heal ourselves using art, language, craft and play. We must find the time and space to experiment with different ideas, materials and techniques, to abandon ourselves to our imaginations so that we can reclaim that hidden treasure which exists in each of us. Remember how the previous chapter suggested that we seek out allies. We must accept the support of those we work alongside and offer it to our colleagues as well. We must create solidarity so that we know that we are not alone in the darkness. We must understand that we are part of a system and learn how to navigate and contribute to these systems to avoid further traumatisation and to protect ourselves from burnout and fatigue. This means cultivating connection, trust, faith and reaffirming aspirations. It means knowing our values and our worth and asking that these be honoured and respected. Remember those examples of protest, resistance, defiance and resilience in Chapter 3 and the potential for post-traumatic growth. For those who work with trauma, vicarious post-traumatic growth, vicarious resilience and compassion satisfaction also become possible. Whilst vicarious trauma may change our worlds, it can also give us the courage and inspiration needed to change the world, to continue to return time and time again to sit with someone in their darkness and remain with them there. Those flickers of light we work so hard to create can brighten our own lives, fuel our own activism and give us the energy to campaign for justice, equality and peace. Bearing witness to distress is a heartbreaking privilege. We see those parts of humanity that others do not and whilst much of the landscape is filled with dark shadows, it will not be all that we find there. We will be fortunate to see pain and relief 
sorrow and delight, grief and love, anguish and joy. There will be darkness and light and a whole ray of colours sparkling in between. When we feel the need to look away and yet remain standing still, we will be rewarded with the most remarkable view. Here I share a photograph taken by Amar, a Syrian photographer and member of the White Helmets. Amar's distinctive style of photography is to capture objects of war positioned against brightly coloured flowers. Like many members of the White Helmets, instead of seeing devastation and destruction as a result of Syria's ongoing conflict, Amar used these images to reflect his hope for the future. In concluding this chapter, I wish to share some ideas which have sustained my practice over the past 20 years. As in all of our work, it is important to acknowledge that each of us will have our own ways of coping with the demands of this work, of mending our hearts when they break and of finding meaning, value and reward. My ideas and suggestions are no more right than your own, but I offer them as someone who's had to claw their way out of these shadows, to live with and around the truth that I've witnessed there, all the while knowing that there is still nowhere I would rather be than standing in that place beside somebody when their world has plunged into darkness. Reflection and learning. Finding the space to ask questions and reflect on our experiences is essential. It gives us the permission to pay attention to how we feel and also encourages us to seek understanding and clarity so that we might generate knowledge and learning. Reflection can be achieved through a variety of different forms, by engaging in structured sessions with colleagues, managers or external facilitators, or less structured ways through conversations with colleagues and managers, or by using social media platforms such as WhatsApp groups to share experiences, seek feedback and exchange ideas. In addition, there are books, online resources and even apps which can be used to guide reflective practice, which can be helpful for those who would prefer to use it as a resource on their own. The point is simply to take the time to think about what's happened, to pay attention to what it might mean and to generate learning and understanding that you might be able to take forward and integrate in the future. Any experience or situation which has generated strong feelings, be it sadness, anger, guilt, shame, satisfaction, happiness, delight, amazement, are all worthy of reflection. All too often we focus on what hasn't gone well in our practice rather than what's right with it instead. In trauma-informed practice, reflection is a tool which can encourage us to focus on both. There are a number of different questions which are suggested to guide reflective practice. However, I prefer the what, so what, now what model, developed by Gary Rolf, Dawn Freshwater and Melanie Jasper in 2001, and I've used it frequently when teaching student nurses. I've since adapted this to create a structure for trauma-informed reflective practice by asking these three questions, but also encouraging practitioners to map their practice against the six principles of a trauma-informed approach and the qualities of reconnection. So often practitioners working in frontline roles tell me of their limitations. They are not a counsellor, they just listened, they just checked in with someone, they just met them for a walk or for a coffee. The word just does not exist in trauma-informed practice. It undermines our efforts, obscures our intentions and underestimates our impact. It misses the value of those qualities of reconnection and the effect of being able to bear witness and remain present. It overlooks the work that we do when we create safety, offer choices to restore control, support coping, facilitate connections, respond to identity and context and build strengths. It fails to notice how we've used our humanity, extending it as a gift to those we work with so that they might know that they're not alone in their darkness. In the toolkit, I share a template for trauma-informed reflective practice in the hope that this will remind you of the value and significance of the work that you do just by being human. If the antidote to compassion fatigue is compassion satisfaction, reflection becomes an essential tool to reconnect us with the meaning of our work and the multitude of ways in which our efforts create those flickers of light, changing someone's landscape forever. You can adapt the template to suit your needs and should you wish to seek feedback, you're welcome to share it with me via email. Curiosity and inspiration. Throughout these chapters, I've referenced the work of others, academics, practitioners, artists, and storytellers. For me, creativity does not come easily. As a perfectionist, self-criticism and self-doubt can spoil the enjoyment that it might otherwise offer. However, reading is quite different. Here I can lose myself in time, devour different ideas, opinions, and suggestions, feed my curiosity and ignite my imagination. I can connect with new ways of thinking and reconnect with those approaches which I may have previously dismissed. The point is not what you read, but how you read it, with openness, curiosity and humility. I have found that audiobooks in particular are a source of inspiration. 
These authors offer companionship as they share their insights, and often I walk as I listen, allowing the knowledge to permeate my thoughts and take up residence there, so that next time I need to draw on their wisdom in my practice, it is right there waiting to be released. Since this discovery, I have begun to share recommendations for books and other pieces of work. I started with Dr Julie Smith's Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before?, a book which creates solidarity, offers reassurance and supports coping through the power of accessible knowledge. I progressed to Christian Neff's work on self-compassion and began to question how and why we talk to ourselves in ways that we would never accept from anyone else. In moments of challenge and difficulty, I started to pay attention to how it felt, experimenting with self-kindness rather than self-criticism. In my work with those affected by the war in Ukraine, I relied heavily on Kristin Neff's research to give them permission to pay attention to their own needs, to rest a while and to hold their guilt, anger and pain with tenderness and care. I went on to read Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart and I was hooked. This act of mapping human emotions has provided me with a new language, reminding me of the significance of the words that we both choose and use and how they can change the course of a life. For example, I supervised a caseworker recently who was working with a bereaved grandfather whose grandson had been killed in a road traffic collision when he was driving. Shame had engulfed him, plunging him into a place so dark he could not bear for his family to find him there. In her work with him, the caseworker explained the difference between the emotions of shame and guilt. That shame meant that he was bad, whereas guilt meant that he did something bad. The shift from shame to guilt did nothing to alleviate the pain of his loss but it was just enough to allow the tiniest flicker of light. As her work with him progressed, this light illuminated the path back to his family and allowed him to accept their enduring love. Knowing how to navigate the landscape of human emotions is a life-saving skill that we should all learn. An atlas of the heart is quite simply a guide to both being human, but also using our humanity for connection. I've since gone on to read all of Brene Brown's work, From Parenting to Leadership, The significance of connection lies at the core of all her research findings. Indeed, it's her work that I must credit for the ways in which I've come to conceptualise trauma-informed practice as the gift of reconnection. These books are just some of the many I've consumed over the past 12 months. On dog walks and long car journeys, I listen, learn, wonder, reflect and question. Each level of this training includes a reading list in the hope that it will inspire and contribute to your practice. Many of the references are available as audiobooks and on Kindle, allowing you to access them in ways which best suit how you engage with new information and ideas. You may prefer that reading is a solitary practice for you and you alone, or instead you could consider creating or joining a book club with colleagues so that you can discuss and generate new ideas together. What and how you read is not important. For me, the most significant aspect of reading is the opportunity to continue to learn and understand, to ask questions and to find answers, In doing so, my commitment to this work is reawakened and revived. Knowing our value and our values. In their work, Fleck and Francis highlights how burnout and compassion fatigue are more likely when our work or the systems that we work with and within conflict with our values and fail to appreciate us and our efforts. Knowing and honouring our value and worth and creating boundaries are essential as a means to protect ourselves if not from heartbreak, from exhaustion, frustration, disconnection, disengagement and dissatisfaction. Paying attention to what's okay and what's not okay is important, allowing us to establish a practice which is both informed by our values and our sense of self-worth, creating authenticity, trust and safety for ourselves and those we work alongside. In her work on leadership, Brene Brown notes that boundaries is a slippery word. It is often used, rarely defined and clumsily executed in practice as a tool to avoid, justify and blame, rather than to cultivate that authenticity, trust and safety. She clarifies how boundaries are in fact making clear what's okay and what's not okay and why. For many of us, setting boundaries is challenging and fraught with anxiety and guilt. Yet when we don't set these boundaries, when we deny what's okay for us, we're left feeling angry, frustrated, unseen and unheard. Most of us work in contexts where organisational culture and the very nature of our work demands our whole selves, the whole time. It can be difficult to rally against this, particularly when our work involves care and support for others in their darkest of times. However, we cannot engage in trauma-informed practice from a place of exhaustion, depletion and disconnection. We cannot work with our whole hearts if they do not have the time and space to mend and refill. As Brene Brown justifies, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. 
When we turn compassion and kindness inwards, we connect with our value and self-worth. It allows us to cultivate and extend these qualities to others in a way which honours both us and them. In addition, Brene Brown talks about the importance of values, both knowing our values and being able to live into them. In her daring leadership approach, a methodology which although not defined as being trauma-informed, most certainly espouses its principles at its core. She defines a value as a way of being or believing that which we hold as most important. In her book, Dare to Lead, she explains how clarity of values is an essential first step in learning how to live into our values, noting it is impossible to live into values which we cannot name. Renee explains how our values should be so crystallised in our minds, so infallible, so precise, so clear and unassailable, that they don't feel like a choice. They are simply a definition of who we are in our lives. She suggests that to achieve this clarity, you should choose one or two values, the beliefs that are most important and dear to you, that help you find your way in the dark, that fill you with a feeling of purpose. As you read them, you should feel a deep resonance of self-identification. Resist holding on to words that resemble something you've been coached to do, words that have never felt true for you. This next practical activity offers the opportunity to explore or reconnect with your values. On the following slide, you'll find a list of values from her work. She suggests selecting the two values that you hold most important. However, she also acknowledges that identifying just two may be challenging, as many of the values on her list will resonate with us and what we consider to be important in our lives. As such, she advises a two-step approach by first allowing ourselves to select up to 10 values. And then once we have this list, she suggests exploring each value in more depth to see if it should claim one of those two positions at the very centre. This is more challenging than it sounds, and whilst most of us have a vague idea of what we value, this exercise prompts us to become really specific to help us to understand what is most important when we have limited space available for definition. I really struggled to identify my two core values. Compassion was straightforward and needed not a second thought. However, justice was more difficult, and in fact it was my husband who chose it, observing how alongside compassion it was the very essence of my being. I would suggest pausing the video now and taking 10 minutes to review this list to help you to reflect, explore and claim your values. It is not easy work and demands that we take the time to reconnect with that which is most important to us. In doing so, we may also notice how far we've strayed from those core values. However, knowing this can help us to find our way back, set boundaries and reclaim our truth. Offering the gift of self-care. Although this chapter is not about how we can look after ourselves, it is necessary to highlight the importance of looking after each other. Fleck and Francis highlight how self-care is a collective act. We cannot take care of ourselves alone or without the support and space provided by the systems we work in. Whilst the previous chapter has drawn attention to the ways in which systems may in themselves be both traumatised and traumatising, this quote reminds us of the importance of extending support to and accepting support from our colleagues. Creating connections, forming alliances and building solidarity provide an effective antidote to the effects of trauma. In much the same way that I use therapeutic resources in my practice, I encourage organisations to offer gifts of self-care to their staff, whether through time and space, to engage in those practices which support them to cope, or by providing them with actual gifts. From fancy biscuits in the communal kitchen and home-baked cakes during staff meetings, through to self-care boxes filled with resources to relax, replenish and inspire. The actual financial investment is irrelevant, what matters is the intention behind such gifts and what they seek to achieve, care, kindness, gratitude and appreciation. A range of ideas and suggestions for gifts of self-care can be found in the toolkit with links to resources with the hope that this will encourage your imagination and creativity. My colleague, Vicky Brown, who as I mentioned in the Silver Level training is responsible for all things creative in my own practice, can also be contacted directly if you wish to discuss ideas. Self-compassion. Finally, if those qualities of reconnection are to be turned inward, we must make a commitment to practice self-compassion. This is far more difficult than it ought to be. Many of us speak to and treat ourselves in ways that we never would another person, much less someone we love and care about. We judge, criticise and reprimand. We withhold kindness, compassion, care and understanding, choosing to blame and shame instead. In her work on self-compassion, Christine Neff explains how with self-compassion, we give ourselves the same kindness and care we'd give to a good friend. In theory, this should be a simple commitment. Of course, in practice, it is not, and it will take practice over and over again. 
Noticing how we talk to ourselves is an important starting point so that we might begin to question the words that we choose, the language that we use and the impact that we intend to make. Christian Neff suggests a three-step approach to introducing this practice into our lives, referring to it as a self-compassion break. She suggests thinking of a situation in your life that is difficult, causing you stress. Call the situation to mind and see if you can actually feel the stress and emotional discomfort in your body. I would caution against using a situation which may risk overwhelming you if you to explore it right now. And if possible, consider something which creates a level of stress, which although challenging, feels tolerable rather than unbearable. If you would prefer not to participate in this activity, or if it doesn't feel safe to do so, please just observe the activity and perhaps think instead how you might be able to use this as a tool with those that you work with, rather than for yourself at this stage. After you've identified a situation, say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. Drawing attention to and naming what is happening is mindfulness. There are other variations of this statement which may feel more appropriate, such as this is painful or this is stressful. Next, say to yourself, suffering is a part of life. Here we're seeking to create solidarity and reconnection by reminding ourselves that other people face struggle and adversity. We are not and will not be the only ones in the shadows. Then we shift our focus to crafting a message of self-kindness in response to the difficulty that we've identified. Ask, may I be kind to myself? And think what this would look like. What do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? If this proves to be too hard to formulate, this is not yet another opportunity for self-criticism. Instead, take a moment to imagine that someone you loved and cared about had shared this difficulty with you. What would you say to them? And write down this instead. Sometimes the only starting point is to pay attention to the kindness that we would extend to others, to grasp hold of it and to turn it inwards when we need it. I would suggest pausing the video now to make sure that you have enough time to follow these steps. Once you have your statement of self-kindness, please write it down in the middle of a square piece of paper. You can create a square piece of paper using an A4 sheet by holding down the top right corner of the paper and folding it towards the lower left side. Bring it down until the paper forms into a right angle triangle. Cut or rip this section below the triangle and then unfold. Next, place the square in front of you with the writing face down. The following slide will play a video to guide you in how to turn this paper and your message of self-kindness into a beautiful paper heart. For those of you who access these recordings in a group setting, we would encourage you to share your messages of kindness with your colleagues if you feel comfortable to do so. After all, kindness is contagious and so we must all catch it. When we make a commitment to trauma-informed practice, it is the commitment to work with our whole hearts, even when it might break our hearts. The gift of reconnection must be both given and received so that we can tend to and mend our broken hearts. Hello everyone, welcome to a new video. Today I'm going to teach how to make a very simple origami heart. This is a traditional model. I think it's ideal for beginners and all you need to make it is a square of paper. You can use any size and any type. I recommend 15 by 15 centimeters, 6 by 6 inches. And the first step is to fold in half along both diagonals as letter X. First this one. Then the opposite. Now rotate the paper in this position and fold the top corner to the middle. Just like that. Now fold the bottom corner to the top. With this done, let's fold half of the bottom edge to the middle. First here on the right side. and then on the left. Right. Turn the paper over and fold these two top corners down. Fold like this until this line.
Now let's do the same on the lateral corners. First this one. And also the other. With this done, our origami heart is ready! As I said, very easy to make, I hope most have been able to do. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click on like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching and until the next time! Chapter 8 – Making Sense of Trauma-Informed Practice The final chapter in this series seeks to bring together both our knowledge of trauma and trauma-informed practice to enable the practical application of the gift of reconnection using a structured approach. Making a commitment to trauma-informed practice is a way of seeing, being and knowing. It is also a way of doing and whilst it's not concerned with fixing, rescuing, changing or problem-solving, it is about supporting someone to cope creating those flickers of light in the darkness and helping them to find a way out. The SENSE model is designed to provide a framework for the delivery of trauma-informed interventions, which can be applied across a range of contexts. It comprises of five key interventions, which have been mapped against the National Institute of Clinical and Healthcare Excellence, or NICE, guidelines for post-traumatic stress and underpinned by the principles of trauma-informed practice. This model was initially developed in response to the Manchester Arena bombing in May 2017. I was working for a Ministry of Justice funded service at the time, which provided psychosocial support to those affected by incidents of terror in the UK and overseas. The team, which comprised of two caseworkers and a manager, was already busy providing care to those who'd witnessed the Westminster terror attack two months previously. Although they offered a national service, as they were based in the northwest of England, their proximity to Manchester thrust the service into the media in the days that followed the attack. Very quickly, the team were inundated with calls from concerned parents, frightened children, anxious teenagers and confused adults, grasping to make sense of what had happened. As their clinical advisor, I was also overwhelmed with the challenge of responding to and providing support to such a large number of people. Faced with a barrage of questions about our approach and intentions from our funder, the media, wider government and the police, the SENSE model was designed as a way of managing the demand for support in a more structured and efficient way. Perhaps more significantly though, it was created to promote calm, reduce panic and restore confidence. In short, a process had been crafted which would offer structure at a time of uncertainty and disorientation. Of course, in that moment of its conception, there was no way of knowing if it would be effective in managing to ensure a response to such a large number of requests, and even if it could, whether it would meet the rapidly changing needs of those affected. But working in crisis demands that decisions are made, plans are formed and implemented, often without the luxury of time for discussion and research. Over the past five years, the SENSE model has been used as both a response to crisis and to structure trauma-informed support, in a diverse assortment of contexts, in the UK and overseas, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and most recently Ukraine. It continues to be developed and refined and to receive positive feedback from both those in receipt of the care and support that it offers and from those who deliver it. Whilst over the years it's been adapted and tailored to specific circumstances, beneficiaries and settings, at its core, it remains true to its original purpose in providing an approach which is pragmatic and accessible to all practitioners without the need for extensive training or supervision. Most importantly though, no matter what shape it takes, it remains true to its origins, those six principles of trauma-informed practice delivered through the five interventions of the model. Stabilisation, education, normalisation, social support and engagement. With these five interventions creating an acronym for the word SENSE, it is a helpful reminder that being trauma-informed rarely requires anything more than our common sense, our sensitivity, our good judgement, our intrinsic ability to be human and our willingness to extend this to others. Our first intervention, stabilisation, reminds us to start where someone is, not where we think they might be, should be or want them to be. So we begin by asking, what do you need? 
What might help? Is there anything that could make you feel better? For some people in some circumstances, the darkness is simply too thick to permeate with these questions. Better is too remote a place to even begin to know how they might travel there. The sense of disorientation and overwhelm too great to know what might help or what they might need. So we offer choices instead. We let them know what is available, what we can do, and introduce ideas of what might help. When someone isn't able to tell you what they want or need, they very often can tell you what they don't want and what they don't need. And this creates a place from which to build. We can also replace the word better with less worse, a location which for some may seem a little closer and more reachable. During a training workshop a few years ago, I provided supervision to a local community support worker in Yemen. She explained that for the family she visited, forced to endure not only the harrowing effects of a long civil war, but poverty, deprivation and starvation, better was foreign and untranslatable. It would not bring them back from the edge of suicide or penetrate their anguish and despair. So we discovered less worse instead, a place which for many remained far off in the distance, but was not so inaccessible that it could not be imagined or talked about. When we work to identify and address someone's support needs, it is essential to remember that these needs will change over time, particularly in the immediate aftermath of a trauma, it may change day to day, or even with every hour that passes. Withholding judgment creates a safe space in which we can keep asking and checking, allowing someone to reflect and review, generate new ideas and explore different routes. When people flounder, are undecided or change their minds, we know that they've begun the important work of processing and making sense of their experiences, remembering that innate desire for meaning. We must not hustle or hurry them. We must only remain present and respond to what they need or don't need in that moment. In trauma-informed practice, practical support needs must be acknowledged alongside emotional support needs. There can be no distinction between the two, regardless of your remit or the constraints of your role. One of the greatest freedoms of a trauma-informed approach is this flexibility to respond to whatever might arise. Whilst we may not be able to assist with all of the needs and wants that are expressed, we can certainly recognise and explore them, offering directions to other places and professionals who might be able to help. To do so allows us to demonstrate our compassion and empathy, and most critically, to meet someone where they actually are, and to work from there. When I first began to work with bereaved families in 2012, I expressed concern to my clinical supervisor that I might not know the right words to say, particularly in that moment so soon after being notified of the death of their loved one. Her advice was simple, ask only what they might need in that moment. My first case came soon afterwards. I'd been providing homecoming briefings and support for the families of a military unit in London whose loved ones had been deployed to Afghanistan regularly meeting with their welfare team to talk through plans for the unit's eventual return home later in the year. One morning they called to advise me that the regiment had suffered a multiple fatality incident, killing three young men. They asked that I join them to meet with one of the bereaved mothers prior to her son being repatriated, along with his colleagues, the following day. We drove to a hotel in Oxfordshire, close to the RAF base, where the flight carrying their coffins would land from Afghanistan. I was nervous and concerned that I would not know this right thing to say, a fear that was only heightened by the two men who comprised the unit's welfare team. They were infantrymen, trained across a five-day in-house training course to shift their attention from soldiering to welfare. They explained that they had asked me to join them because they did not know the right thing to say. Some hours later, I met the mother in a hotel lobby. After expressing my condolences for her loss, I asked, do you need anything at the moment? Paracetamol, she replied. Since being notified of her son's death, she'd done nothing but cry. Her head ached and she was hoarse from her tears. She was exhausted but did not dare close her eyes, knowing that when she did, in those first moments of wakening, she would relive his death all over again. I found her some paracetamol and asked the hotel staff for a glass of water. There were so many things that I could not do for her. I could not change what had happened, nor could I alter what was to come but this I could do for her. I often recall this case during times of uncertainty, fear and overwhelm. Even now, 10 years later, having worked with countless bereaved families, each new referral stirs up these feelings, on the drive to visit them at home or when I take a deep breath and steady myself to call them. However, this advice has never failed me. To pay attention to what someone needs, to ask and explore what might help, 
is to show them your intention not only to join them in the darkness, but also your dedication to create some light, no matter how trivial it may seem. I shared this example in a training workshop a few months ago, and Merlin drew this illustration. When I asked her about it afterwards, she explained how the tiny dot of yellow, the only colour in the sea of black ink, was that paracetamol tablet. There are times when to achieve stabilisation, other forms of intervention may be necessary. These could include medication to assist with specific difficulties, such as disturbed sleep, low mood or anxiety. Someone may also require trauma-focused therapy, although it's often recommended that a period of what the NICE guidelines term active monitoring is initiated in the first four to six weeks after an experience of trauma before a referral is considered. However, sometimes psychological treatment is required sooner and this focus on stabilisation from the outset allows us to identify what is needed, who is best to provide it and to refer onwards so that early intervention may become possible. Our second intervention, education, is about offering information, developing self-awareness, building knowledge and creating understanding. Most importantly though, this process of education links to our next intervention, normalisation. By knowing, understanding and increasing self-awareness, we can also explore and examine. In chapter one, we considered how responses to trauma, struggle, adversity and pain were in fact normal. In chapter two, we discussed the effectiveness of recognising and reframing behaviours as coping and wise adaptations. By ensuring someone's access to information, we not only remind them that they are normal at a time when they feel disconnected, isolated and disempowered, but we also draw attention to their shared humanity by naming and contextualising these behaviours. What if when we create these sparks of light in the darkness, they realise that they are not alone in their suffering after all? It is important to remember that people will need different information about different things at different times and provided differently. For example, some people benefit from receiving information more broadly about the impact of trauma or loss. They want to understand their symptoms and to feel reassured about how they're responding. For other people, the knowledge that they require is focused around understanding specific processes such as the criminal justice system or what happens in the post-mortem examination of their loved one following a sudden death. Some people want to know everything, others wish only to know enough. The most significant aspect of these interventions is to ensure that they're given or signposted the information that they need. Likewise, if we consider the role and value of families, parents and caregivers and wider social support networks, extending these interventions of education and normalisation to them is equally beneficial in strengthening these connections and creating other avenues for information, knowledge and understanding to be dispensed and sustained. These two interventions are perhaps best summarised by Judith Lewis Herman who writes, The traumatised person is often relieved simply to learn the true name of her condition. By ascertaining her diagnosis, she begins the process of mastery. No longer imprisoned in the wordlessness of the trauma, she discovers that there is a language for her experience. She discovers that she is not alone. Others have suffered in similar ways. She discovers further that she is not crazy. The traumatic syndromes are normal human responses to extreme circumstances. And she discovers finally that she is not doomed to suffer this condition indefinitely. She can expect to recover as others have recovered. Education and information is one of the most powerful things you can offer. It is another potential source of light in this darkness, creating not only knowledge and understanding, reassurance and connection, but enabling control and power to be reclaimed. I have grappled with the name of the fourth intervention over the past five years. It refers to social support in recognition of its value, heavily influenced by the significance of the principle facilitating connections, which underpins a trauma-informed approach. However, this intervention has been challenged by practitioners for two reasons. Firstly, those working with victims of sexual abuse, violence and rape have highlighted the challenges of exploring and identifying sources of social support for many of their beneficiaries who feel unable to disclose their experiences. These concerns are often reflected in the formation of specialist organisations for survivors of sexual violence, providing dedicated spaces free from judgement and stigma. Such services are undoubtedly vital and effective in delivering much needed support. However, their reach is often limited to the survivor, overlooking the support which is or could potentially be offered by others in their lives. As such, there are missed opportunities for reconnection beyond what is directly provided by practitioners. 
Whilst the bond which is formed between practitioner and survivor is an influential aspect of a trauma-informed approach for cultivating connection and trust, it is only one part of what's needed. Say, for example, the survivor meets with their practitioner for one hour of each week. That leaves 167 hours in that week unaccounted for. Whereas if we mobilise and strengthen their access to social support, it increases the likelihood that some of these remaining hours can be filled with other people, other conversations, other things which might help them feel, if not better, then certainly less worse. This is not to say that I do not appreciate the unique and profound difficulties in accessing social support which are frequently reported by survivors of sexual violence of all ages, but it is to say that if we are truly to offer the gift of reconnection, we must look further than ourselves to work with both survivors and their communities, their family and their friends, in order to achieve this. Towards the end of this chapter, I'll talk a little more about the varying configurations of the SENSE model and specifically how Peterborough Rape Crisis have been using it to work with the families of survivors to strengthen their access to social support. The second challenge to this intervention unsurprisingly came as a result of the pandemic when regulations around physical contact were introduced globally between early 2020 up to the middle of 2022. This was a period for many which was characterised by loneliness and isolation. During this time, I worked as the clinical advisor for a Department of Health and Social Care funded sudden bereavement service and witnessed how the death of a loved one compounded this isolation and loneliness, creating an unprecedented level of disconnection amongst families, within households and across the entire country. Such was the intensity of this disconnection that often caseworkers would tell me that they did not know how or even where to begin these conversations around social support. I shared two examples. The first, a young man, aged 19, who lived with his father. Both tested positive for COVID and remained at home in isolation. Unfortunately, his father deteriorated and died a short time later. Because of his positive COVID status, he could not accompany him to hospital, nor could he receive visits from other relatives or friends. He was to remain in his home for a further five days, alone with only his grief. Food would be delivered to his doorstep and any conversations would take place through a locked front door. There would be no capacity for warmth, affection or physical comfort. I wondered at the time if we needed to create another word beyond anguish to describe these such experiences which sit beyond even this pain. During this time, rather than focusing on social support, we shifted our approach to explore everything which helps him to cope and feel less worse. His assigned caseworker called him throughout the day, every four hours, to encourage him to eat after he shared that he felt sick and lightheaded from the lack of food. She helped him to structure his day so that he might manage his solitude without becoming overwhelmed by despair. She made tentative suggestions to prompt him to respond to messages from his friends, maintain contact with them and seek them out when he felt in need of connection. We wrote to his GP to ask for their input to help him to sleep. We called his college tutor to let her know what had happened so that she could offer support directly. We looked for connection wherever we could find it. We explored everything that provided him even the briefest moment of comfort. We walked into that cloying darkness and we stayed with him there for those five days. In the second case, an elderly lady in her 70s contacted us following the sudden death of her husband of 50 years. They had lived alone, having had no children of their own, and since the start of the pandemic they had become increasingly isolated. Many of the usual activities that they would engage with outside of the home were subject to social distancing regulations and had either been cancelled or moved online. In her first session with her assigned caseworker, this lady disclosed that she felt desperately alone and disconnected from those around her. So much so that she wondered whether she wanted to continue to live without her husband, who had been her closest companion for so long. She described empty days and panic nights where she would lay awake breathless with fear and anguish. She could not tell us anything that made her feel better. After several further conversations using the term less worse, she eventually recalled that watching the Antiques Roadshow made her feel marginally, fleetingly less worse. And so from here we began. We asked questions about why and how it made her feel less worse and how often she watched it, how she watched it, for example, live or on catch up television. And then we started to explore other television programmes, similar in content, tone and length and encouraged her to try these as well. From here we would go on to talk about books, radio shows, exploring her ability to navigate social media and eventually encouraging her to access support via bereavement group online. 
it would take us a long time and require our commitment to both identify and understand what was and would support her to cope. The limitations were unprecedented and unlike anything I'd ever worked with before, but we had a place from which to start, the Antiques Roadshow. Both of these cases demonstrate how when social support is difficult to identify and access, it's necessary to focus on how we can support someone to cope more broadly in the first instance, to achieve stabilisation and to address someone's immediate support needs. It's only from here that we can come to appreciate the barriers to locating and engaging with social support. Whilst in these cases the impact of the pandemic was exceptional, as the concerns from those practitioners working with survivors of sexual violence reflect, experiences of trauma can disconnect people to such an extent that trust in all humanity is broken, creating isolation and loneliness. These cases highlight the need for innovation and imagination so that we may find ways of working around these limitations to rebuild trust, cultivate connection and accomplish reconnection. For some this may be about strengthening those relationships which already exist. For others, the focus will be on forming new connections. What's most important is that we construct a path back so that someone can rejoin the human commonality. Literally mapping out the support that someone has available to them can be an effective way of both understanding and exploring those people, activities, places and even animals which support coping. It also encourages someone to become very specific about exactly how these people, activities, places and animals support them. What does it look like? What do they offer? How does it feel when you are there? For example, I might label my husband as supportive, but it's useful to be more exact. He is tolerant and withholds criticism when I work outside of normal hours or need to do things at short notice in the event of a crisis. He listens and responds when I seek advice and reminds me of what I've achieved when I feel helpless and overwhelmed. Mapping support allows what might otherwise be ambiguous and vague to be made more explicit to both us as practitioners, but perhaps more importantly, to the person themselves. It allows someone to see what is available and to reconnect with its value and importance in their lives. In addition to acting as a reminder of what was always there all along, it can highlight gaps, prompting reflection and leading to action to change the very contours of the terrain on this map and discover new places to take refuge. Its very process of creation has the potential to be transformative. All we need is to be curious about what is already there. However, for some people, mapping support can be difficult and painful for the ways in which it draws attention to how little is there or what is missing. Whilst this presents a challenge and must be managed with compassion and empathy, it likewise offers an opportunity for reflection and change. Such discussions, whilst painful, are not the source of someone's pain. Rather, we have created the space in which they can connect with both what is needed and lacking. To know what is absent allows us to start conversations about where and how we might find it. There are countless ways in which these maps can be constructed, digitally, by hands, through imagery, colour, words, collage, or a selection of symbolic objects. Map making is yet another opportunity for creativity, imagination and inspiration, no matter what is generated or where it leads someone. Like all maps, they will never be completed, only refined and updated with new discoveries or when new roads are built to bridge the gap between where we are and where we wish to be. They are honest and true representations of what already exist and what might be waiting for us in the space beyond what we know. Most importantly, these maps have the potential to guide someone from disconnection to a place of reconnection. This slide shares an example of Dominic's map of support. His approach uses colours to depict the people, places and activities in his life which are present, some of which are beneficial and others which are detrimental to his well-being. This offers us a unique insight into his world and enables us to ask questions about why and how to understand further what is and isn't available to him. We are introduced to his friends and family by name, allowing us to remind him of them during times of difficulty or struggle and to encourage his connection to both them and those other places and activities which we know will help. No matter what has happened to plunge someone into darkness, reconnection to friends, family and communities is vital for recovery. As Judith Lewis Herman explains, traumatic events destroy the sustaining bonds between individual and community. Those who have survived learn that their sense of self, of worth, of humanity depends upon a feeling of connection with others. The solidarity of a group provides the strongest protection against terror and despair and the strongest antidote to traumatic experience. Trauma isolates, the group recreates a sense of belonging. Trauma shames and stigmatizes, 
the group bears witness and affirms. Trauma degrades the victim. The group exalts her. Trauma dehumanises the victim. The group restores her humanity. The fifth intervention, engagement, is informed by the four previous interventions which have identified needs, practical, emotional and educational, explored access to social support and examined those people, places, activities and even animals which support coping. At the fifth intervention, engagement with these sources of support is made possible through research, but more importantly, through creativity, innovation, imagination and inspiration. The purpose of this final stage is to connect and reconnect someone with who and what supports them to cope based on an understanding of the uniqueness of their needs. Often when someone experiences trauma, struggle, adversity and distress, they become disorientated, lost, confused and overwhelmed. It can be challenging to both know and engage with what might help. By researching what's available, the intention is to develop a list of organisations and services which may be able to offer what's needed. The nature of these can range from sports clubs, arts and crafts, yoga, relaxation, mindfulness and meditation through to psychological therapies and mental health services, such as counselling or trauma-focused treatments. This is done, firstly, on the understanding that not everyone will either need or want psychological treatment, and secondly, the knowledge that access to these services often takes time and requires a long wait for support. So this is where creativity, innovation, imagination and inspiration take hold, as we give permission to consider other options for support beyond these more conventional approaches recognising the value of social support and indeed any activity which promotes coping as valid and effective, precisely because it allows someone to determine for themselves what they need and want and to establish their own ideas about what form this should take. After all, we are not the map makers, they are. This stage of intervention shares similarities with other approaches in healthcare, such as the social prescribing model, which seeks to address someone's needs in a more holistic way by referring them to community organisations to focus more generally on their health and well-being. However, it also moves beyond this model from exploring and identifying these organisations to considering barriers to engagement and how these may be addressed and overcome. In this final intervention, we use the findings of our research, our discussions and the ideas which have been generated to create a letter in which we outline what's available, how it can be accessed and why it might be of benefit. This acknowledges that someone may not always be ready to access these organisations and offers them the time and space that they may need while ensuring that they have the information to hand for the future. The social prescribing model is available in some areas of the country, providing a valuable resource. However, when it's not offered, we can undertake our own research to generate ideas instead. The internet is an effective resource, providing information, However, addressing barriers to access means that it will be helpful to contact any organisation directly which you intend to recommend to find out more about their eligibility, any waiting times they may have and more specifically what they can offer. Experience has demonstrated that these details can make a significant difference to facilitating engagement. Suddenly joining the boxing class becomes easier when you know that it's run by Alan, the lead coach who sounded really friendly on the phone, that about nine people, mainly women, attend and that they often go to the pub afterwards for a drink. This approach also demands creativity, imagination, innovation and inspiration. It may not always be immediately obvious which services and organisations might support someone to cope, and so exploring, experimenting and seeking feedback will be important. For example, after the Tunisia beach terror attack in 2015, a lady who'd been physically injured during the incident explained how since she'd returned to the UK, Despite the progress she'd made in her recovery, she remained fearful of leaving the house. She was becoming increasingly isolated and reliant on her adult daughter to take her shopping and to appointments. We had suggested several different options, such as relaxation techniques and even using a befriending service, before we found a solution which she felt comfortable with. Prior to the attack, she had acquired a puppy, and whilst he proved a valuable source of support, she described feelings of guilt that she was not able to exercise him regularly. With her consent, we contacted a local dog walking group and explained the situation to them. They agreed to come to her home on a daily basis and collect her so that she could walk with them and then accompany her home again. Gradually, she began to feel more at ease with the route and able to meet them in the park. This increased her confidence to travel to other places on her own again. Indeed, her motivation to engage came from her concern for her puppy, 
but her courage to move beyond what she considered to be the limits imposed on her by her experience was encouraged by the social connections she'd formed with the group and their unwavering commitment to support her. Such cases remind us of the importance of seeking those opportunities to rejoin the human commonality, using our creativity, innovation, imagination and inspiration. In doing so, we can open up someone's world to new possibilities, allowing light to permeate their darkness. Whilst the SENSE model offers a structure in which these trauma-informed interventions can be delivered, it's not intended to be prescriptive, conditional or binding. There are already too many psychological approaches which either rely on a preconceived idea of where someone must be in their recovery journey or recoil when someone falters on this path, stumbling further into the darkness. I hear countless stories of rejection which occur precisely at the moment when distress is intensified and support is needed the most. Trauma-informed practice is different. We start where someone is, wherever that may be. Whilst these five interventions are designed to be delivered in chronological order, What is most important is to respond to the needs of the person you're working with when they arise. This may necessitate moving back and forth between the interventions or spending more time on some than others. Remember that this is a framework, not a set of instructions, contingent on the compliance of either you or the person that you're working with. I consider that one of the greatest freedoms of this approach is that each intervention both allows for and encourages someone to consider what they want, what they need and the route that they wish to take to get there. After all, as Judith Lewis Herman writes, the first principle of recovery is empowerment of the survivor. She must be the author and arbiter of her own recovery. Others may offer advice, support, assistance, affection and care, but not cure. Many benevolent and well-intentioned attempts to assist the survivor flounder because this basic principle of empowerment is not observed. No intervention that takes power away from the survivor can possibly foster her recovery no matter how much it appears to be in her immediate best interest. After all, in trauma-informed practice, the roles of healer and wounded have no place. When we offer kindness, compassion, warmth and understanding, we do so from our position of sitting beside someone. We must seek their preferences, listen to their perspectives, ask about their needs and pay attention to what they want. Since its inception, the SENSE model has been used by practitioners and organisations in a range of different ways. For some, it offers a crisis intervention response for professionals in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic event, helping them to shape conversations, assess needs and plan for the care and support which is needed. For others, it has provided a structure for longer term work, drawing on its flexibility and capacity to empower survivors and to position them as their own map makers. Several organisations have used the model for both purposes simultaneously to assist them in managing referrals into services where demand is high and capacity is limited. For example, one charity created a system whereby free sessions of the SENSE model were provided to clients on their waiting list to ensure their access to immediate support. The results were extremely encouraging, with some of their referrals requiring nothing more than these free sessions, whilst others entered the service stabilised with increased self-awareness and a better understanding of who and what supported them to cope. As a result, the eight sessions of the SENSE model which were offered in service were more effective, engagement was increased and feedback about the impact of the care received was not only positive, but recognised and affirmed the progress that they'd made, travelling further than they'd ever thought to be possible, given all that they'd endured. A trauma-informed approach to care and support must and can always exceed expectations. In this place of darkness, what is possible is rarely detectable to those who find themselves there. However, when we ask what's right with someone, when we attribute authority to survivors, to determine what they want and need, and when we accompany them on their journey to reconnect with those people, places, activities and communities of support that allow them to rejoin the human commonality. We make visible what exists within each of us so that it can be reclaimed. Every service is different, with varying resources, demands, constraints and scope. There is no single way for the sense model to be applied in practice. However, the majority of organisations have found that an 8 plus 2 model works effectively to offer time-limited support. Initially, up to eight sessions are provided with the option of two further sessions to review and strengthen the engagement with other support services. The frequency of these sessions also varies. For some, they are offered weekly or fortnightly as part of a standardised approach to care. For other services with more flexibility, the regularity of the sessions is determined by the recipient based on what and when they need it. For crisis intervention, three to four sessions is recommended wherever possible, 
although single sessions which use the stages of the model to shape conversations have also been found to be effective in stabilising and encouraging connections with family and friends. As a professional who regularly works with crisis, I also believe that something is better than nothing and I abide by the principle of equality by offering a little to everyone rather than a lot to few. In practice, this is a challenging value to implement. During the height of the pandemic, I provided clinical guidance to a sudden bereavement service, which quickly became overwhelmed with referrals for support. We started with eight sessions, moved to six, and eventually we were only able to offer four. Conversations with practitioners were tough. They would regularly ask for more sessions, concerned that this was not enough for the individuals they were working with. However, the large numbers of those who were still waiting for care meant that it was all we could do. When you work with and in crisis, whatever you can do has to be enough. And when you work with compassion, kindness and empathy, it can be enough. Finally, several organisations have introduced an additional pathway comprising of free sessions from the model designed to offer support directly to members of someone's social support network. While some sessions may take place jointly, practitioners who work with survivors of trauma have found it beneficial to create a separate space for family members, spouses and close friends to explore their experiences, focus on their well-being and access information and guidance to strengthen their capacity to extend support to their lived one. Successful examples of this have so far emerged from practitioners working with those affected by terrorism, survivors of sexual violence and sudden bereavement. Whenever I deliver training on the SENSE model, questions are always raised about how its impact can be measured. A true trauma-informed approach does not readily lend itself to a predetermined set of outcomes, often favoured by funders and those who commission services. Instead, a trauma-informed approach encourages beneficiaries to decide for themselves what they need and hope to accomplish. This gives them the freedom to choose what is most important to them, to set their own agenda for the work that will take place and to establish a process of accountability which values this uniqueness, positioning them firmly at the centre. Indeed, the first collaborative act between the practitioner and the recipient of their care should be to understand these priorities and create a goal to work towards. Of course, the goals which are selected need to be within the scope of the service to deliver. But this process also encourages someone to draw on their imagination to consider what the world might look like beyond the darkness. Demonstrating impact is important, not only for funders, but also in ensuring that what we do works for someone. Do they feel seen, heard and valued? Have we understood their needs? Holding ourselves to account is necessary to ensure that we remain focused on where someone is, rather than where we think they may be or wish them to be. We can standardise this approach by creating free statements by which to measure progression. The first, I've not achieved this yet. The second, I'm working towards achieving this. And the third, I have achieved this. This allows for a strength-based outcome measure which is designed to recognise and celebrate resilience and coping which lies at the heart of a trauma-informed approach to practice. Of course, it also has the added advantage of providing that standardised measure of progress and impact across the whole service for funders, whilst being a useful way of checking that the support is meeting the needs of beneficiaries, as identified by themselves. Much of the work that we do is time limited, and in as much as there's a need to think about what and where next for those we're working with, there is equally a requirement to pay attention to how we manage endings. Endings can be challenging for us as practitioners, as well as for those we work with. The relationships which are established when we practice in a trauma-informed way are characterised by their endurance, commitment and capacity to move beyond connection to create reconnection instead. Often ending these relationships can constitute a loss for both us and them. Managing expectations and offering honesty and transparency from the outset is essential. Preparation for endings can be woven into the final two stages of the SENSE model through the strengthening of social support and by exploring other services and organisations which can support coping. And it's important to ensure that there's enough time and space for conversations to take place. Perhaps most critical is the acknowledgement of the impact of endings, the permission to talk about them and the safe space to explore them further. Setting and adhering to boundaries is vital. Some services have clear directives around continued contact and follow-up support, others do not. In the absence of this, you'll need to consider your own boundaries what's okay and what's not, and this will look different for each of you. However, whatever pledge is made, it must be one that you are sure you can honour, not just now, but in the months and years that follow. 
In my own work, I've learned from experience the strain that this commitment can cause and the hurt and confusion it can evoke when it's not honoured. Instead, I prefer to pay attention to the progress that's been made and to acknowledging the privilege of being part of someone's journey by sending them a card or a letter to mark the ending of our work. This allows me to reflect what's right with them in a way which I hope will act as a lasting reminder of who they are and what already exists within them. When someone has experienced trauma, struggle or adversity, we must reach beyond connection to offer reconnection instead, drawing on our innate humanness, kindness, compassion and empathy. We must be creative, imaginative, innovative and inspired so that we can decorate and personalise our own gifts of reconnection. In addition, implementing a framework in which to deliver trauma-informed care may allow us to work coherently and with confidence across a range of contexts, including in response to crisis. I offer a conclusion to this level and indeed the whole training series by reminding you that trauma-informed practice is the journey from disconnection to reconnection. Anyone can offer the gift of reconnection. It's wanting to which makes the biggest difference. It's noticing stopping and turning back to peer into the darkness and to stand beside someone in this place. Offering the gift of reconnection needs our humanity and our willingness to extend this humanity to others. It requires our dedication to step into this darkness and act with our whole hearts, even when it might break our hearts. In bearing witness to distress, we are privileged to observe moments of great strength and courage. We see those parts of humanity that others do not. And whilst much of this landscape is filled with dark shadows, at times there is also the most incredible light. If trauma-informed practice is an act of humanity, then it's everyone's business. From the barista in the coffee shop, the customer services agent, the teacher, the police officer, right through to the palliative care nurse, all of us should expect and practice a trauma-informed approach. It is a way of being, seeing, knowing and doing. Our ambition in these trainings has been to create a trauma-informed everything where compassion is embedded in the infrastructure and kindness is currency. Thank you for joining us on this journey. As always, we welcome your feedback. Please feel free to contact me directly.